Hi, this is the Demographics Decoded podcast with me, demographer Simon Küstenmacher. And me, Michael Yardney, property and wealth creation expert. And this is the podcast where we unveil the trends shaping our futures. In today's episode, we're going to explore Warren Buffett's theory on the lottery of life. It's a powerful reminder of the role luck has in shaping our destinies. Warren Buffett one of the most successful investors of all time, is not just known for his financial acumen, but also for his profound insights into life and society. Simon, welcome back. It's uh, the Demographics Decoded podcast is creating quite an audience. Uh, exactly. It's nice to have more and more people uh, sharing our love for demographics uh, online on all different podcasting uh, platforms. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Well, in my mind, Simon, one of the most compelling concepts of uh, Warren Buffett was what he called the lottery of life, often referred to as the ovarian lottery. Uh, Simon, uh, I guess you've heard a bit about this too. Oh, absolutely. And it's important to understand the, the role of chance, of luck, uh, if you will, in your life, because there is much more that shapes uh, your life in the background than just the actions that are in uh, within your control. Um both are absolutely important in, in uh, shaping the future of your personal life in, and the uh, future of our collective um, lives. Well, let me initially start with Warren Buffett's explanation of this, and then I'd love to have your views on it, because the basis of Warren Buffett's ovarian lottery was explained by him to a group of university students at the University of Florida. And he said something like this. He said, I've been extraordinarily lucky. Uh, Warren Buffett said, I mean, I want to use this example. I'm going to take a minute or two because I think it's worth thinking a little bit about. He went on to say, let's assume it was 24 hours before you were born and a genie came up to you and the genie said to you, hey, you look very promising and I've got a big problem. I've got to design the world in which you're going to live and I've decided it's too tough. So the genie says to you, this is Warren Buffett, of course, saying it, you design it. And you say back to the genie, I can design anything. There must be a catch. And the genie says, there is a catch. You don't know if you're going to be born black or white, rich or poor, male or female, infirm or able-bodied, bright or retarded. All you know is you're going to take one ball out of a barrel of 5.8 billion balls. And I guess that was the world population in those days. And Warren Buffett said, you're going to participate in the ovarian lottery. He went on to say, and that's going to be the most important thing in your life because it's going to control whether you're born here or if in Afghanistan, whether you're going to be born with an IQ of 130 or an IQ of 70. It's going to determine a whole lot. What type of world are you going to design? Well, that's what Warren Buffett said to these students, Simon. And so the term ovarian lottery refers to your nationality, your gender, your race, your health and family background. These are obviously factors over which you've got no control, Simon, yet they profoundly affect your life. Yeah, and it feels like when uh, the genie did ask Warren Buffett before he was born uh, about his his future, he did answer in 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 a way that worked in in his favor. Um, you know, he's born in uh, 1939, um, so into a rich family into a or reasonably rich family in the United States, already the most powerful country in the world by then. Um, he had access to, to, to education. He had general opportunities of a, of a safe life and upbringing. Um, so that's pretty good. He also picked uh, to be a male um, in a male-dominated society. Growing up, I guess he grew into age in the 50s, um, still a male-dominated society, white. Uh, that helped in the, in the US. Um, all of these things worked in his favor. Of course, he put in um, um, hard work, his general intellect. Um, and of course, he had a certain kind of drive, determination uh, that helped him forward. But ultimately, yeah, it is the ovarian lottery uh, that did set him apart from an equally skilled and equally strong or educated person um, in a less advantaged country uh, with a uh, different skin color in the same neighborhood than he grew up or something like this. Yeah, so it is very much um, a luck of a draw that determines your fortunes to a degree um, before you are born. That's interesting because only last week I was uh, having a chat with my uh, grandchildren about this. I knew we were going to talk about this topic to make them recognise, realise how lucky they are born in Australia at this time in an affluent family because uh, we were talking a little bit about what all the problems were overseas. But, Simon, so, in Australia we're growing uh, 
seeing a growth in the economic disparity in different regions. How do you think the ovarian lottery is going to play out in Australia if you're born in one of our big capital cities or in rural Australia or maybe even in different states? I know I mean, the reason I'm asking you this is because I've read one of your blogs and I know you write regularly every week in the New Daily, uh, not behind a paywall, so everyone can read your content on a Saturday and your columns in The Australian are very good as well. In uh, They're behind a paywall. But I do remember reading something about life expectancy being different in different states, even in different suburbs. Um, exactly. And your, your life expectancy is essentially linked to your wealth. Um, yes, uh, health factors uh, like do you smoke, do you not smoke, do you drink, do you not drink, do you exercise, do you not exercise, um, and genetics, all of these things play in there as well. But ultimately, if you live in a um, remote area, um, you don't live as long. That is because you do not have regular access to the same kind of medical uh, facilities than people in a big city might have. Um, the, the access to fresh food in really remote areas in Australia is is limited and uh, you live like that for a couple of decades um, and then all of a sudden you, you, you split society apart into people that live longer and to people that do not live longer and yeah there, there is an element of luck there you do you are of course theoretically free to choose where you want to live in Australia yeah, we don't have any restrictions on movement, <laughs> not anymore, at least after the pandemic. Um, but um, yes, you can move out of a remote area. Nobody is forcing you to stay there. But um, there are certain kind of uh, invisible shackles. Um, do do you, uh, Are you actually aware of your opportunities outside? Is this a lifestyle choice that you want to make? Um, and we then have a society that operates on different um, yeah, on different paths. And we obviously have this really remote cohort in Australia, even though we are overwhelmingly the most um, urbanized country that you can imagine. Um, so most people live in a city, but still within this city, we have vast um, differences uh, of lives that we live. And increasingly over the last couple of decades, we segregated in our cities according uh, to our income, according to our wealth. We are segregated based on socioeconomic lines. And quite often we forget that this is the case because you look around in your neighborhood and people next to you, your neighbors, they have different skin colors, different cultural backgrounds, they speak different languages, they have different sexual preferences uh, from you. It, it looks like a rainbow, it's all so diverse. But everyone in your street is just as rich or as poor as you are. And so you, on a daily basis, you do not even understand anymore um, that there is another half of Australia that lives a very different life. And it's always super important to, at least through empathy, um, to remind ourselves that there is a court that views the world through their lived experience very, very differently um, from us. Well, I think one of the lessons I learned when I read about this theory many years ago was don't judge people. You don't really understand where they've come from and, and what's going on in their head. But I've always considered myself uh, being lucky that my parents migrated here when I was the age of three. You've clearly migrated to Australia as well. And many people would say Australia's the lucky country. Um, uh, there, there was even a book about that, wasn't there? But with all the concerns today about the cost of living, the cost of housing, the sluggish Australian economy, um, the, the, the crime that's happening, Simon, is this still the best place in the world? I guess it's a question of perspective. Uh, of course, it's a, a, a question of perspective. And it doesn't need to be the most lucky place of the world. We just want to make sure that we are in a bloody good place, uh, so to speak. And you can measure this, of course, in, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, do something silly like um, GDP per capita, a good measure, a rough measure of, of wealth, of income per person. And then, yeah, we're tenth, the 10th tenth richest country on the planet in this ranking, according to the IMF. Um, so that's that's pretty good. You know, just where we're sandwiched between Denmark and the Netherlands, that's a good that's a good neighborhood uh, to be in. Um, 
and so yeah that that's that's very decent and it tells a story of a free society and that's of course the story why we are a migration nation people want to come to this it's it's a good general um, measurement if people want to come to your country uh, this means does the world as a whole uh, um, think of you as an attractive destination and Australia definitely um, fits that uh, category yep, we still provide a freedom of movement um, it's very easy for us to be um, cynical about movement so things move into a wrong direction and we we overemphasize those movements and say we are now a a um, a catastrophe of a country when people talk about we of course record this in Australia they talk about um, the dictatorship of Victoria or something like this uh, during the pandemic we are being a bit overly dramatic in our statements there we must remember that the baseline which makes Australia this lucky country is still very very much um, the case and we continue to be in control in Australia. I think we, we forget about this. There's dumb luck. There is the uh, ovarian lottery just by the continent. Uh, you pick a country and we just happen to have an awful lot of valuable stuff in the ground. We also have a lot of uh, you know mining products that we sell to the world. We also have a lot of ground. So we grow an absolute bucket load of food that we export with a profit to the world that's beneficial and then we do a bit of tourism a bit of education on top and we are a successful enough economy um, and that's pretty cool and that's not going to be taken away from us anytime soon but we still then need to make the most out of this luck that we've been um, granted uh, and that means we constantly need to readjust the, the way we want to develop our economy so yes we export raw materials and agriculture and mining but should we do more value-added uh, manufacturing in home should we do you know or should we export um, raw wheat? Uh, or should we uh, should we export flour? Should we export um, value added food products? Should we uh, export uh, just iron ore? Or should we make steel in this country? Hard questions, but we go. We can be more in control of our own fortunes. Well, we're talking about money here, and you started off talking about the GDP, but to be a lucky country, we've got lots more. We've got a good health system. We've got a good social security system. I know there's lots of flaws in each of these things, but basically it's a nice place to live. But if we just spend a minute or two more talking about money, um, one way we measure the wealth of a nation is its GDP. And I'm not downplaying the hardship some people are currently having with the economic problems and the cost of living, but overall, Australia ranks, as you said, um, ninth. There's only uh, in the ranking of the world in gross domestic product per capita, one way of measuring wealth. Interestingly, only the USA has actually got a larger population. All the other countries above us are small um, city states like Qatar, like Singapore, like Luxembourg. So we really do punch well above our weight. Hey, just like we did in the Olympics, Simon. Ah, uh, the Olympics were a great uh, example of Australia being outrageously successful considering uh, the size of our country. Um, and we also need it. Uh, we are a sport-loving culture. And I, I've long been pointing to the importance of sports in Australia because um, that is providing social cohesion. It also makes a big difference in the ovarian lottery, whether you grow up in a country that is uh, torn apart or whether the country has a sense of uh, belonging and national identity, so to speak. And uh, over the last couple of decades, we had a couple of things that did provide social cohesion in the country disappear. Religion provided a sense of belonging. Um, by now, half of the population are non-believers and the other half is spread across a multitude of faiths. So faith doesn't provide a sense of cohesion anymore, not on a national level. Um, the middle class uh, kept eroding away. We now have a big court on the top, a big court on the bottom. And so the middle class doesn't provide social cohesion. That really made sports and the uh, outrageously cool Olympic success uh, very, very important um, for Australia. Yeah? No pressure uh, for all those uh, athletes at the Brisbane Olympic Games in eight years. Uh, but that is what the nation desperately needs. Um, and every now and then you see, uh, if you've seen videos online of, of um, there's a sprinter in Lesotho, a poor uh, country, uh, who came home to an absolute marvelous uh, crowd, you know, tens of thousands of people um, carrying him through the streets, essentially. That's pretty cool. And you see the power of sports and nations want to feel 
like one. And ideally, we do this in peaceful terms like sports rather than, you know, um, dictatorial um, kind of ethnocentric, brutal um, leaders, blood and soil type narratives. Now, Warren Buffett often mentions the influence of family wealth on success, and clearly it does make a difference if you're born into wealth. Now, we've discussed that in a couple of the previous uh, uh, Demographics Decoded podcasts. So if you're listening to this on your podcast app or you're watching this and you haven't heard Simon and me talk, just download the previous episodes as well so that you can hear a little bit about the wealth transfer. But I'm going to ask you in a second, Simon, to update us. And by the way, if you're enjoying this conversation and you don't currently subscribe, whether you're listening to us on a podcast app or watching on YouTube, please just subscribe so that once a week you're going to get the information Simon's going to share with us. But Simon, talking about family wealth in Australia, um, what trends are you starting to see? Because it seems like the middle class, as you were starting to say, is disappearing. Um, and so there's the rich and the poor. Um, and there's going to be the intergenerational wealth transfer like we spoke about before. Yeah, so one big thing in Australia is that uh, we have one essential good that we all need that became super expensive. That's housing. And so the easiest way of um, getting onto the property ladder is if mom and dad give you quite a bit of money, uh, the bank of mom and dad, as we call it, um, that pushes you, uh, gives you a leg up on the property market. That is one way of transferring international uh, intergenerational wealth uh, from the parental generation to the younger generation. And so then this cohort that has asset owning parents, they can accrue more wealth and that further drives them up the successful trajectory financially. Whereas um, an equally um, um, skilled person who does not have uh, cashed up parents um, do not have that leg up. And so the ovarian lottery very much plays a role here. It's just who your parents are matters. And as a society, you always go, yeah, we want to correct this in a, in a, in a, to a degree. We cannot say, oh, we just delete, we take all the wealth of persons once they die and then we distribute it in some sort of uh, communist, uh, socialist scenario. That's not what we're talking about. We, but probably I would expect um, that we will continue to have, we, we have social uh, safety nets already, but we'll find more taxation measures of trying to distribute wealth a bit more. We see this already when we when I read policy writings of people in their 30s and 40s. So people that are just before uh, the they reach positions of real power and influence, um, they already heavily discuss the idea of taxing wealth rather than income. And that's one way of, of, of leveling the playing field. So in a sense, the state sometimes wants to soften the impact uh, that your family has on, on your future trajectory and rather than go, hey, it'd be really cool if we uh, if you get as rich as you can by your own means, meaning your own pr uh, productivity, your own drive in work. Um, yeah, and at the moment we, we allowed, uh, because housing is so expensive, we allowed that uh, the family became more important uh, than, than it should be. And I would project that we are correcting this in the next couple of decades, um, step by step. There won't be any harsh, crazy revolutions in Australia uh, to do this, but we'll incrementally move that way. I agree with what you're saying. Now, Simon, you often discuss the importance of access to education. I know you've written about this a bit. How can the demographic changes, the trends in the education influence the long-term impact of the ovarian lottery that falls on us? Yeah, so um, traditionally, um, education was a very simple tool of projecting your future success um, because the more educated you were, uh, the higher income you ended up earning. And so the, the role in life was quite simple. Earn, uh, earn more degrees uh, and you'll have more money. So it was pretty easy to give decent financial or career advice to your kids. Um, but what we now find ourselves, and we find ourselves in a country where half of a year 12 cohort wants to go to university or goes to university. Um, all the while, our business model of mining, agriculture, tourism, bit of international education, we don't need half of the workforce in skill level. They're called skill level one jobs. They're highly educated jobs. Um, so education is a bit um, 
is difficult because we now have quite a few big opportunities in the middle skilled education sector um, where all of a sudden we say, well, if you happen to be a tradie, like a good plumber, a good electrician, and you run your own business uh, so that you capture all the wealth that you create um, yourself, um, then you out earn quite a few of those highly skilled uni, uni type um, folks. Um, the property sector traditionally was one of those fields uh, for a long while. Um, if, if you said, I have somebody who does not have a lot of formal education, what field should they go into? The answer would have always been um, property, property, property. Um, so to a degree, uh, we softened the impact of education, but statistically, it's still true. The more highly educated you are, the easier the access to education for you was, the better your lot in life. Well, what about technology, Simon? Because I guess what we're saying is that some people are a little bit luckier in the ovarian lottery in Australia than others, even though compared to other parts of the world, we're all very lucky. Do you think the rapidly advancing changes in technology, the fact that I can have a computer in my hand and look on chat GPT and find everything I want, is that going to serve as an equaliser? Um, yes and no. Um, so, so, so to a degree, even if you live in a very remote community and you have a basic laptop, a basic smartphone and a bit of an internet connection, you have access to all the educational material that you want for free. There are MOOCs, massive open online courses uh, that actually give you top, top level education. If you were outrageously driven, um, you could educate yourself to an insane degree. And once you could then, sh if you were able to show this to a future employer, they could give you a top job based on this thing. So yes, in theory, um, technology is massively leveling the playing field. Uh, but you need to be taught. You need to be indoctrinated into the world of technology. And I would argue a highly skilled uh knowledge worker, parent couple is much more easily uh, inclined to teach their kids uh, these ways than a, um, you know, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged couple in a remote community. Um, so the risk is that, te that technology makes things worse and further, um, you know, barricades you behind your existing uh, social status. Uh, but at least in theory, there are all those opportunities out there. Interesting. So um, how do you think the ovarian lottery of life is going to uh, be affected by uh, the demographic changes for future generations? I mean, part of what our basic tenant for this show is, is to see how things are going to change in the future. So uh, are there going to be any major, whether it's climate change or significant economic policies or, or maybe just even the changing demographics we've discussed in previous shows, is that going to make have any effect on this or are we still just going to, some of us be luckier than others? No, it, it definitely has, has effects on it. If you look at uh, just a global historic perspective, we zoom out a lot. The last 80 years were a decade were decades of outrageous political stability um you know the cold war ensured that there were, you know we're always at the risk of or the brink of war but nothing happened uh, and so global war deaths went down um for the first time since the second world war just in the last five years we see those uh, numbers of deaths in in wars and all those horrible measurements they ticked up for the first time in a long time again um so it it, it depends of course where you are in, in australia we're still utterly untouched and unaffected um from from those um developments whereas if you were born in ukraine in the last 20 years things looked pretty good until two years ago um, and so uh, these fortunes can very much change because the the environment that you find yourself in that is ex very much impacting you it's the same if you live in a poor part of the world um, what the ukraine war did is it drove up global food prices that's great news for australia because we export food we we made more money we increased our gdp this way it's terrible news if you find yourself to be in the bottom 2 billion people uh, of this of this planet and this was severely terrible news so it's always a matter of perspective where am i finding myself and how are big certain global movements impacting uh, my fortunes and it feels rather cynical uh, to say um australia is located in a sense that we we benefit in indirectly from quite a few terrible developments like global high food prices that is not a good news 
story for humanity, but we benefit from it. Yes. Well, we've also, uh, I guess we've already pointed out that the poorest people in Australia uh, would be considered rich by many others around the world. Uh, we, I thought in the past, had a reasonably robust social safety net. I'm not sure that's really the case anymore now when you see hear stories about people who can't get into hospital, can't have operations for a long time, the pension isn't enough, uh, social housing isn't adequate. Um, how's Australia coping? Is the government social safety net, are the government policies uh, equalising things or are they letting us down? Um this is one of those yes and no answers at the same, at the same time. We are still very much providing social safety nets. Um, we're providing uh, unemployment benefits. We, uh, we extended our, our, um, you know, support, uh, in the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We tried to, we very much have the idea to widen the social safety net. The problem is that this has gotten more and more expensive. Um, because if you have a basic thing like housing being very expensive, um, and you as a state were, um, you know, complicit in not adding a social housing stock over the last 25 years or so, um, that's not helping. Uh, so that means then in order to, to, to offer crisis accommodation in times like uh, we live in today is outrageously expensive and you can't pull it off anymore. Um, and we now have people, you know, all those stories, those working uh, poor people. We now have quite a few of them in Australia, people that are full time employed in low income jobs. But um, for them, even finding a rental uh, uh, apartment is, is absolutely impossible. Um, so that's a systemic uh, unfairness uh, that we must address. The good thing is in the housing crisis, everyone is talking about it. And that's a new development in the last two years that did not happen in the decades beforehand to that degree. We now are at a breaking point where we understand the system is changing and so we're adjusting to it. Of course, we talk about something big like housing. You're not making housing cheaper or more expensive from one day to the next. We, we, and we discussed this in, in, in your Michael Yartney podcast, um, uh, quite, quite frequently when we talk about property in more and more details, uh, how those developments play out on the housing market. And it is one of the biggest issues in Australia. So that puts the social safety net at, at risk to a degree. Now, I remember reading one of your articles in the New Daily a while ago, and I apologise, it was in the Australian, where you actually said, forget media and house prices, there's actually a better way of gauging housing affordability. So I'm going to ask you that question next week in uh, next week's Demographics Decoded podcast, based on what you just said, it reminded me that I think that would be a good topic to discuss. So if you're listening to this on your podcast app, or you're watching this on YouTube, and you've already got to listen to Simon and me for half an hour, and you've enjoyed what we've said, just stop for a sec. There's a couple more things I'd like to ask, Simon, but just stop for a sec and subscribe on whichever podcast app you're listening to this so that you can keep getting Simon's wisdom twice, uh, sorry, one, once a week moving forward. Now, Simon, I'd also like to just get your thoughts on the global demographic trends. How do you think the ovarian lottery is going to affect you future global inequality, uh, because there is quite some inequality. I remember a couple of years ago, Pam and I uh, did a, a cruise in a very luxurious ship, <laughs> stopping at the very poorest parts of the world on the west coast of Africa. And it was terrible to see how these uh, people uh, lived. Um, are, are we heading for more or less equal opportunities worldwide? Um, we are getting richer as a planet. So we very much continue to improve um, poverty. So we make sure that um, a smaller share of the global population lives in what we call extreme poverty. That is an undeniable success. That is quite wonderful. Um, so we do like that. Of course, inequality tends to be measured as uh, what does the gap between the richest and the poorest people look like. And we did allow a system where if you if you measure something like what share of wealth is held by the top 100 persons, by the top 0.1% uh, globally, or whatever exact measurement you do, we've seen that the top, 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 top people, we're not talking about people who have a couple of tens of millions of people. These are poor people uh, by those global measures. We're talking about the billionaire class. Um, they own more and more money. And um, that's structurally speaking the case because we tend to tax income uh, rather than wealth. 
And so as long as you do that, it's very easy to hold on to wealth um, once you have a certain amount of it. Um, and it's very hard to earn more money if you have very little wealth. Um, so yes, um, we make, we're pushing more people out of poverty. That's a big development. But are we getting more equal? Um, probably not. And total equality, of course, is not the goal. Uh, I think that that's that's always important to understand that that's nobody wants that. Um, the the idea is always to go give people a fighting chance, um, and uh, as if you if you don't do this, uh, then it's an unjust society. And ultimately, those systems are always correcting themselves. If inequality becomes too extreme, sooner or later, and you can ask all the kings of of yesteryear, um, they became increasingly afraid of uprisings. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying Australia is at the verge of an uprising or anything silly like this, but that is the extreme case that you move to and you don't want to do this, especially not in a country like Australia where the, where the, um, national, um, idea of, of, uh, you know, of being very, um, equal, um, um, that is still strong. So, you know, we, we're destined to actually p- correct these measures a bit. Now, I'm going to ask you a bit about government policy in a second, but I just want to explain to people who may not know about what you do that part of your role at the demographics group is consulting to organisations, to businesses, and in fact to to advise and consult with governments as well. So if people actually do want to hear you, get your research, understand what it's going to do for their businesses or their industries, I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to have a chat with Fiona uh, at the demographics group to see if Simon would be of benefit in helping your organisation. But you mentioned to me only a couple of minutes before we started press the record today that you are in Canberra yesterday talking to government. So, and putting uh, some uh, policy thoughts to them to see if uh, they can change their thoughts or policies. So what about levelling the playing field? What kind of policies or initiatives do you think governments could consider to level the playing fields for those born on the less fortunate side of the ovarian lottery? Yeah, the first are a couple of social safety nets. So unemployment benefits and so far, these things are tools to do this. Um, the, the one thing that I very much see in my policy crystal ball uh, when I look into the future uh, would be the taxation of wealth. Uh, it's a bit more of the Swiss model um, where you allow people to have quite a bit of their chunk of their income. Uh, we, you know this, once you reach a certain tax bracket in, in Australia and many uh, developed countries, about half of the money that you earn goes to the uh, uh, to the tax man. And that's frustrating. And of course, that that is really hurting any kind of tax dollars, hurting the lowest income earners the most and the richest income earners the fewest because they still accrue wealth and the wealth is not taxed all that much. Um, so I would then predict that governments will look at things like taxing wealth. So a property tax, uh, meaning a land tax is, is a tool to do this. So you go once a land is of a certain size, of a certain value, you slap a tax on. Um, and then, you know, the rich people that can afford an expensive property, they are being hit every year with a tax. It will not be destroying their wealth or something, but it'll be a, a hit <laughs> uh, to them and it, it will help to level the playing field. That's one of the most obvious uh, policy um, uh, things that I, I would think of uh, because you then encourage income uh, to play a more important role in, in somebody's fortunes. Well, Clearly, as you said, the aim isn't to level the playing field so everyone's the same. But the people at the top, I think it's our responsibility to help other people up the ladder in Australia and around the world. But maybe I could just finish off by saying that I believe we, anyone who's listening to this or watching this, you have won the lottery because you're most likely living in Australia or in a Western country and at the best time in history, despite all the problems. Now, Simon, as I mentioned next week, this is not a property podcast, but I would like to get your thoughts a bit about uh, why you thought medium prices weren't the best way to judge uh, affordability. And of course, we're going to be talking about demographics and what it means for housing, and that's going to affect everyone who wants to listen and learn from you and me anyway. So I look forward to catching up with you again next week. Uh, Same here. Next week will be very interesting. This is statistics uh, that do not hurt your brain. It's good fun.
My pleasure speaking to you again. Catch up with you next week, Simon. This Demographics Decoded podcast was brought to you by Metropole Property Strategists. We provide a complete range of services to help our clients safely create intergenerational wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you're looking to buy an investment property or your next home, why not have a discovery chat with one of our wealth strategists? Go to metropole.com.au and explore your options. You'll find we're much more than just another buyer's agent. We provide a complete range of services, including property and wealth advisory, home buying, buyer's agency, property management, renovations, and development management services. The team will help you with frameworks that I've fine-tuned over five decades and we've been helping clients with for over 25 years. We're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but still small enough to care. You can follow me on social media, but I suggest you also follow Simon Kirstmacher. You'll find him regularly posting on all the social media platforms. I'll include links in the show notes. And thanks for spending the last little while with Simon and me. I hope you got some benefit from the show. And if you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Demographics Decoded podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. You'll be doing them a favour. I hope you will anyway, and you're definitely going to be doing us a favour, helping us in our quest to make as many people as possible aware of the demographic changes that are going to shape their future. And of course, any of the discussion we had today was not personal advice about your future, but just general information to help you.